In section 2.3, we're going to look at some characterizations of invertible matrices. So um, we're going to look at basically how invert invertible matrices are tied to some of the other stuff that uh, we talked about in chapter 1 and, um, and then look at some definitions as well. So the first term that we're going to look at is the term singular matrix. Okay, a matrix is singular if the inverse does not exist. Now, we actually kind of stumbled on this by accident at the very end of our last video in section 2.2 that our matrix, excuse me, if our matrix is not inver invertible, when we put it into the calculator, and ask for an inverse, the calculator will say invalid, it'll give you an error, and it'll say matrix is singular. So that term singular just means that the inverse does not exist. And obviously the matrix is non-singular if the inverse does exist. So the goal of, the, of this section is to kind of combine the ideas, what we learned about singular matrices, or excuse me, what we learned about non-singular matrices and singular matrices in the last section with what we know from chapter one, okay, and see how they're connected. Now, before we get started, I do want to mention that the matrices that we're going to be mentioning here we're going to assume are square because we know that the only matrices that can have inverses are square matrices okay so the only ones that can have proper inverses are square matrices so we're going to deal with only square matrices in this section so this is the big takeaway from section 2.3 it is the invertible matrix theorem. And it's the thing that ties together all of our invertible matrices stuff with what we learned back in chapter one. So let's assume that we have a matrix which is square. So a square matrix, if A is n by n, well, if we have a square matrix, then the following statements are equivalent. First, A is invertible. So if A is invertible and it's square, we learned last time that when you put it in row reduced echelon form, it will give you the identity matrix. Now, so if it's invertible, we, it will row reduce to the identity matrix. Because it row reduces to the identity matrix, think of what the the identity matrix does. Let's uh, go and write an identity matrix. All right, so go and oops, go and write an identity matrix. Now look at what this identity matrix is and what the characterizations of it are. This is the three by three identity matrix. But in general, notice that when you, if you row reduce the identity, you're getting out three pivot points. And notice that in the identity matrix, if we were thinking about solving um, a matrix equation, let's say AX equals B, we're going to, first off, get a solution for every B because there's no rows of zeros. Secondly, we're not going to have any free variables. So because if our matrix where reduces the identity, we don't have any free variables, we have exactly, in this case, three pivot columns, three pivot positions, and we can solve for any B. And that's kind of what these properties are saying. So if A is row equivalent to the identity matrix, then A is going to have n pivot positions. Okay, it's going to have, again, like we saw in our 3 by 3 case, it had three ones. Also, the equation AX equals 0 
only has the trivial solution. Now that's because there were no free variables. So no free variables means the homogeneous equation, homogeneous matrix equation only has a trivial solution. The columns form a linearly independent set. Again, that's a no free variables. So the columns are linearly independent. Another way of saying that is that this matrix equation only has the trivial solution. Also, if we row reduce the identity, it turns out the linear transformation is one to one. Again, this is coming out of the no free variables um, understanding. So the transformation a times x is one to one because we have no free variables. The equation ax equals b has at least one solution for every b because there's no row of zeros. The columns of A will span Rn. So since it has a solution for every B, we know that it spans Rn because you can obtain any B you want to. And since you can obtain any B you want to, another way of saying that it spans Rn. Another way to say that is that the linear transformation you get by multiplying A times a vector maps Rn onto Rn. So, in other words, the linear transformation is not only one-to-one, -one, but it's also onto. And then this is just saying there is this matrix C such that C times A gives you the identity. There's a matrix D such that A times D gives you the identity. All right, J, K, and L aren't the most important properties. Um, saying it has an inverse obviously we can find the inverse matrix. Also the transpose, if you swap the rows and columns of an invertible matrix, you will also have still an invertible matrix. That's uh, again, not a huge, huge thing that we're gonna look at. The main points are that if A is invertible, it row reduces to the identity matrix. We saw that last section. And that identity matrix gives us all kinds of stuff now that will carry over from chapter one. For instance, if it row reduces to the identity matrix, then AX equals zero only has the trivial solution, which means the columns are linearly independent, which means the transformation is one to one which means the equation, well, that doesn't. Um, row reducing to the identity means that you have a solution for every B you can choose. Another way to say that is that the columns of A span Rn. Or another way to say that is the transformation is onto Rn. Okay, so A through I are the most important equivalent statements. Now, by the way, if A is square and it is not invertible, then all of these statements would fall. So all of these statements would be untrue if the A was not invertible. Okay, so it is an if and only if kind of situation. So the types of questions that we ask in this question or in this section, excuse me, are going to be things like true-false statements or, um, you know, explain how these two things can be connected. All right, so let's start with a couple of true-false statements. And we'll assume our, ma our n by n matrix, or, uh, excuse me, our matrix A is n by n. Okay, so it's a square matrix. So this says, if the columns of A form a linearly independent set, then the columns of A span Rn. So think back to these equivalent statements. The columns of A form a linearly independent set. and the columns of A span Rn. 
So since these are equivalent, if one of them true, if the one of them is true, then the other is true. So yes, this would be true if the columns form a linearly independent set, then the columns span Rn. Now I do want to make a really quick mention of something um, that goes along with this. Linearly independence we get because there's no free variables. The spanning Rn is because each row has a pivot position. And I just want you to understand that this is those two statements are equivalent for square matrices. Okay? And we were assuming that A was square because all of our A's in this case are square. But I just want to say if this wasn't a square matrix, we could get a situation where, like in this case, if A were 3 by 4, we could end up with a free variable, but still the columns would span, all right? So this was highly dependent upon our matrix being square. So we can say true to that first bullet point as long as the matrix is square. If the matrix wasn't square, we could not say that, all right? Now let's look at the second statement. I want you to push pause on the video, think through that second statement, and see if this is a true statement. This statement is false. So this second statement here says if A is an n by n matrix, so if A is a square matrix, then the equation has to have a solution for each B. And it's false because in this case it doesn't specify that A has to be invertible. So we could have a situation where we have a square matrix and when you row reduce A it comes out looking like this. All right, so this matrix is square. However, it you can't solve for every B because there's going to be eventually a column over here where we're going to end up with 0 equals 1. All right? So this one is false. There are n by n matrices which are not invertible, and those are not going to have a solution for every B. I want you to take a moment and go through, push pause on the video, and decide if these statements are true or false. All right, hopefully you've uh, done this. Let's go through that first bullet here. If A, X equals zero, so we got the homogeneous equation there. If that only has the trivial solution, then A has fewer than N pivot positions. Now to only get the trivial solution, the only way to get the trivial solution is to, well, I should say, let me rephrase that. The only way in which a homogeneous equation, homogeneous matrix equation, only has the trivial solution if A is square is if we row reduce to the identity. All right? Now, this is going to have exactly N pivot positions. In this case, our n was 3 because we were a 3 by 3 matrix. So if you reduce to the identity matrix, you're going to have exactly n pivot positions. And therefore, ax equals 0 only having the trivial solution, then a has fewer than n pivot positions.
that statement is a false statement. So the first bullet point is false because we know that having the only the trivial solution means that you row reduce to the identity means that you have exactly n pivot positions. And then that last bullet is true. Okay. Now, again, this last bullet is true. The transformation, if the transformation is one to one, then it is also on to. But you may recall when we were looking at one to one and on to matrix transformations that there were some transformations which were only one to one and there were some transformations that were only on to and did not have the other property but again one to one and on to are equivalent as long as we have square matrices okay so this statement would not be true if a could be non-square but it is true when a is square all right so when a is a square matrix an n by n matrix then if we have one to one we also have on to just to remind you again what one to one meant essentially was that this matrix equation has no free variables all right that's one to one and on to meant that this row uh that's me this matrix the rows each row has a pivot position all right so no free variables and three pivot positions are going to be there when we have a square matrix but again if you added another column then everything goes to crap basically all right so yes this is true for these square matrices now the other types of questions that you that may come up are things like this it says, for instance, is it possible for a six by six matrix to be invertible if the columns are linearly dependent? And explain why. Well, the answer to that is no. And we can go to the Word document to see in fact why this answer is no all right so this is the matrix this is a six by six matrix now in order for a six by six matrix to be invertible it has to row reduce to this this is the six by six identity matrix okay so in order for it to be invertible it has to row reduce to the six by six identity matrix notice that we do not have any free variables there's no free variables here and that means each column in my original matrix was linearly well I should say the set of columns from my original matrix would have had to be linearly independent so no free variables means we are linearly independent okay so six by six matrix is invertible then it row reduces to the identity so we don't have free variables which means that our columns are linearly independent all right let me write that down real quick um to be invertible the matrix row reduces to the identity which has six pivot columns and no free 
variables. So since we have no free variables, that implies the columns are linearly independent. Okay, so there you go. No free variables implies that the columns are linearly independent. And therefore, this statement, is it possible for the 6 by 6 to be invertible and the columns be dependent? The answer would be no. It is not possible for that to happen. I want you to push pause and try the second one. Is it possible for a 6 by 6 matrix to be invertible if the columns span R6? All right, well, this one is a resounding yes. All right, yes, if we span R6, then what we're going to need whoops, is a pivot position in each row. So to be invertible, we row reduce to the identity matrix, which has six pivot columns and six pivot positions. Uh, let me put this, and a pivot position in each row. OK, so because we have a pivot position in each row, means that the equation ax equals b is solvable for any vector b so again a one in each row means that no matter what you put as your outcome vector b, you can solve for it. And therefore, the columns of a must have spanned r6. Let me do this. Oops. Put a Z in there. So R6. There we go. Does that work? Let me bold these up a little bit. Just to highlight what they are. OK, hopefully that all makes sense. So to be invertible, we row reduce the identity. And because we row reduce the identity, we end up with six pivot positions. That means that there's going to be one pivot position in each row. And therefore, we do span R6. So there you go. That would be a very good explanation. Now, one outcome of invertibility is that we get some kind of weird looking statements like this. We say if AB is invertible, so if the product of two matrices is invertible, then A also has to be invertible. And by the way, just uh, so you know, B, you could have used B here. So basically, if the product of two matrices are invertible, then each one individually also has to be invertible. OK? Let me actually explain why that is. Um, we can just turn to some pretty simple arithmetic and what we know about invertibility. OK? So uh, 
Let me kill that real quick and say, okay, let's assume we have AB. Our matrix AB is invertible. So we're going to assume that that's true. What's that mean? That means there is a matrix. Well, we'll call it, it doesn't matter what you call it, but uh, we know it's going to be A, B inverse. You could have called it D or C or something. So that... If I take AB and I multiply it times its inverse, we get the identity. All right. Now, here's the thing we know that matrix multiplication. While it's not commutative in general, it is associative. So what you can do is you can break up that A, B. Instead of making this A, B as a single matrix, think of it as the product of A times B. All right. And then what's going to happen here is we can say, well, this is a matrix that exists. Therefore, B times that matrix will also exist. And so notice what we've done. We've found a matrix that if you multiply it times A, you get the identity. All right. And by the way, if you wanted to do this with a, a different letter, you could. You could have done that with a letter, for instance, D. You could have said, well, there must be a matrix D so that you multiply and get the identity. And by associativity, what we see is that A multiplied times this product has to be an identity. So we found a matrix we found an inverse for A. Found that BD is the inverse of A. Okay. By the way, you could have done the exact same operations and showed that B also has an inverse. Okay. In fact, once you see this and how it works, then all you have to do is multiply by C on the other side and see that B has an inverse as well. Okay. So if the product of two matrices has an inverse, then each matrix individually will also have an inverse. So that's one of the neat things about inverses, the neat properties, is if you can kind of factor a matrix into a multiplication of one times a multiplication of the other, then each one of those individually must also have an inverse. Now, I want to make some observations about some different types of matrices. And we're going to learn about new types of matrices here called triangular matrices. Now, a triangular matrix is just a matrix where there are zeros either below or above the main diagonal. So we call an, a matrix upper triangular if when you draw the main diagonal, we end up with zeros below it. So we look at this one, for instance, draw the main diagonal, 
Since there's zeros below it, that is upper triangular. Draw the main diagonal. Since there are zeros below the main diagonal over here, then that's upper triangular. This is a four by four upper triangular matrix because we have zeros below the main diagonal, okay? And most oftentimes, the only time we use the phrase upper triangular is for square matrices, okay? So just as a convention, again, we're always dealing with square matrices here. So square matrices are upper diagonal, uh, excuse me, upper triangular if there's zeros below the main diagonal. Now, you can also have lower triangular matrices. And these are exactly what you would expect. Instead of having zeros above the diag, excuse me, instead of having zeros below, you have zeros above. So the only time you have non-zero numbers is when you are below the main diagonal and above the main diagonal is zero numbers, is entries of all zeros. Okay, so entries of all zeros are above. My non-zeros entries are all diagonal and below. All right, hopefully that all makes sense. Now, by the way, just as a so sort of side note, all diagonal matrices, remember we saw some diagonal matrix, matrices earlier, like for instance, the identity matrix is a diagonal matrix because it has zeros above the diagonal and zeros below. The only non-zeros are on the diagonal itself. So every diagonal matrix is actually triangular, and in fact, it's both upper and lower triangular. Let me go to a Word document to explain what I mean by that. So, let's assume that we have a diagonal matrix. I will do a three by three diagonal matrix, something like two, zero, 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 five, zero, 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 six, okay? So that is a diagonal matrix. The only non-zeros are on the diagonal. And notice that diagonal matrix is upper triangular because there's zeros below the diagonal. And it's also lower triangular because there are zeros above the diagonal. So a diagonal matrix is triangular, okay? The identity matrix is triangular the all zeros matrix. So the zero matrix is also triangular. Above and below the main <coughs> diagonal, all we have is zeros, all right? So lots of different triangular matrices, but what do we know about inverses of either lower or upper triangular matrices? Well, a triangular matrix is going to be invertible if and only if the diagonal entries are all non-zero. Now that's actually pretty easy to see in an example, but let's uh, let's kind of show it through an example. All right. So let's take a three by three matrix, which is, I'll do upper triangular. And let's say our diagonal entries are all non-zero, okay? So I claim that this is going to be invertible. And it's easy to see why, because when you row reduce this five, this three and this four are all gonna be pivot points. So because it, these are all gonna automatically be pivot points 
again, the zeros here give away the fact that 5, 3, and 4 can be pivot points. And so because these are all pivot points, we know it's going to row reduce to the identity because we have three pivot points all on the diagonal. And that's it. So three pivot points looks like we reduce the identity. Now, if something were to happen where we have a zero as one of our diagonal entries, then I can look at that and I can immediately say, well, the only two pivot points, I'm going to have that as a pivot point. This five is going to be a pivot point. And you can either choose the 8 or the 4. I'll choose the 8. Notice we're only going to have two pivot points here. So because we have this 0 here, it throws the number of pivot points off and does not allow us to row reduce to get to the identity. So that's just a long way of saying if you have a triangular matrix, a 0 on the diagonal makes it not invertible. If all of our numbers on the diagonal are not zero, it is invertible. So I want you to take a look at these two matrices. Again, they're both triangular. And take just a minute to decide which one is invertible, which one's not, and do that. So push pause on the video. over to Word. So notice this first matrix here. No zeros on the diag diagonal. So no zeros on diagonal. It is a triangular matrix. It is lower triangular. So those two things in common mean that this matrix does have an inverse. Does have oops and inverse by the way if you remember the fancy word for that is non singular right it has an inverse so it is not singular all right let's go to the next one the next matrix obviously does have a zero on the diagonal and this is upper triangular. So he has a zero on the diagonal. It is triangular, specifically upper triangular. So that means it does not have an inverse. And not having an inverse, the fancy word for that, is singular. All right. So basically that works. By, by the way, this old trick only works for diagonal matrices because we have this nice, um, basically, triangle of zeros. So my pivot positions can pop out. If this is not triangular, then, you know, who knows what's going to happen. But because we have this nice sort of triangle of zeros, we can use that theorem. Now, the last big concept we're going to look at today in this video is the idea of an invertible linear transformation. This is going to be very, very similar to the idea of invertible matrices, and in fact, is going to be very well connected. So, we say a linear transformation is invertible. First off, notice that real quickly. We are going from Rn to Rn. So we're going from one space to the space itself. That way we can go back and forth. And what that also means is that T can rep be represented by a square matrix. All right. So a linear transformation is invertible if there's some other transformation, some other function 
that when you apply the function s and then in fu the function the function t you get back to where your original spot was and also you could have done that in reverse if you apply the function t and then the function s you get back to your original spot no matter which vector we chose no matter what the vector was from our n and we use the same inver excuse me, invertible inverse notation. If this is the case, we see, say, T and S are inverses of each other, and we can write S as T to the negative 1 power. Now, the obvious um, connection between linear transformations is go and invertible matrices is that if you remember every transformation could have been represented by a matrix and so it's going to be pretty obvious that if the transformation was invertible then so would the matrix that's associated with the transformation and in fact vice versa too if the matrix is invertible, then the transformation will also be. All right. So the matrix and the transformation are either going to be both invertible or both not invertible. All right. Also, interestingly enough, the inverse of the transformation, you guessed it, is going to be what you get when you take the inverse of the matrix. So if the transformation is invertible, then the matrix associated with the transformation is invertible, and also the inverse of the transformation can be found by taking the inverse of the matrix. All right, so all of these things are very well connected. So let's determine if the following linear transformation is invertible. Now, I'm going to kind of explain really quickly how to do that, and then I'm going to have you push pause on the video. So first, let me explain. There's hard ways and easy ways to do this. The hard way is to try to come up with a transformation that undoes T. So if the transformation undoes T, then we could, you know, look for it. The easier way is to say what we just said in the last slide. Well, if the matrix that's associated with this is invertible, then T must also be invertible. So let's create the matrix and then utilize our calculators to see if it's invertible and, you know, find the inverse if we want to. So I want you to do that. Create the matrix associated with this transformation see if that matrix is invertible. And if it is invertible, let's actually, let's go ahead and find the inverse. So push pause on the video and go ahead and do that. All right, hopefully you took the time and did that. So here's what uh, we're gonna do. We're gonna take this transformation it goes 3x1 plus 7x2, and then this would be no x1 plus 8x2. And we associate this matrix A with that transformation. Again, if you want to check, just take this matrix and multiply it times x1, x2 by a row column expansion and see that you get that. All right, so that's your matrix A. Now, is this matrix invertible? Well, it is, yes, it is going to be. There's a number of ways we could have determined that. Um, first, this is upper triangular. So we could have said, well, there's no zeros on the diagonal. Since it's upper triangular and no zeros on the diagonal, I know it's going to be invertible, right? Another way we could have done that is to create the matrix A and put it into our calculator, 3708, 
2 by 2 matrix A. And then ask or your calculator to see if it can find an inverse. So hit that inverse button. Go plug in A, hit the inverse, and hit enter. And sure enough, it has an inverse. By the way, let me uh, solve what that inverse is in fraction form. All right. So not only does it have an inverse, but our inverse is 1 3rd, negative 7 24 0, 1 8. And by the way, another way we could have done this, we could have adjusted, we could have done what we call last time the sort of mega matrix. Create a 2 by 4 matrix where my matrix A is only the first half. And then I have the identity as my second half. Go back to the home screen. Put that big old matrix in row reduced echelon form. And yes, we got the identity matrix in the first part and then the inverse in the second part. So again, a number of ways you can do this, but in all roads, we say A does have an inverse. And namely, if we want to write down the inverse of A, we go A to the negative 1 was equal to. And then I'm going to write it with fractions. So 1 third negative 7 24. Let me write that down so I don't forget. 0 and 1 8. So It'll be a two by two case. Oops. I hit the right button. I did not. Um, so the inverse, in fact, is one third negative seven over twenty four, zero, and then one eighth. Okay. Again, lots of ways we can tell that it has an inverse. And then a couple of methods like the one we used last time, the ones we used last time to calculate and figure out what the inverse actually was. All right. So I want you to do the same thing for this next example. Oops. This next example here. All right, so hopefully you went ahead and did that. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to go back. We're going to first off create the matrix that's associated with this transformation. So if our transformation takes x1, x2, and gives out 1x1 plus 4x2, and then negative 2x1 minus 8x2, then the matrix you're going to utilize is 1, 4, negative 2, negative 8. OK? Again, check that if you want. Do the row column expansion. 1 times x1, 4 times x2, negative 2 times x1, negative 8 times x2. All right, so that's your matrix. A number of ways, again, to figure out if this matrix has an inverse. You could, for instance, plug it into your calculator and then go to your home screen. Ask your calculator for the inverse of A. It's going to say error singular matrix. So we know that, oops, we know that A does not have an inverse. Does not have an inverse. In fact, A is, well, the fancy word for that, A is singular. All right. So that's, that's that. 
by the way, the one uh, the one method to find the inverse I didn't do would have been utilizing that formula. I don't know if you remember that from last time, but remember if we have a matrix and it's two by two, we could have found the inverse by creating one over AD minus BC. We swap the A and D spots and then negate the B and C spots. All right, so you could have used that formula as well. And you could have just said, well, let's take AD, that's A times D is negative 8, minus B times C. So we get negative 8. So that, uh, let me put it this way, AD minus BC would have given you 1 times negative 8 minus negative 2 times 4. Or, let, let me do that. Usually people put the B first. So, again, that's my A position, that's my B position, that's my C, that's my D. So because this AD minus BC, which remember last time we called the determinant of A, because that thing was zero, that would be that would have been another way to figure out that A is singular. So we could have also figured out using the determinant. Okay. We did that last time, so I won't uh, waste any time today. So that is it for section 2.3. Um, next time, we're actually going to skip a few sections, so be ready to do that uh, in the near future. Um, but that's it for 2.3, some characterizations. Check out the homework on that, and as always, if you need help, uh, give me an email.